Good morning, and uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank Elder Spears and Sister Spears and uh, for the opportunity to come and talk to you a bit about some of my background and then tell you a bit about some of the organizations I've worked with. Um, I've lived in Hawaii for about 20, this July will be about 29 years. I'll admit, I think this is maybe the third time I've been on this campus, and uh, I'm really impressed, actually. I, I had previously visited the farm uh, in my role as deputy director of the Department of Agriculture, but never seen the main campus, so I'm very glad to have had this opportunity this morning to come up and, uh, and talk to you. Uh, I was hoping for a better day, as I'm sure all of you have, but I assure you, uh, we're all sharing the bad weather on Oahu. Downtown was equally uh, dreary. So, uh, that being said, I, uh, I learned about two days ago that this is part of the entrepreneurial series, so I kind of had to scramble a little bit. Um, you know, currently, uh, I'm in a role as the trade representative, Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone. So when I was looking at how I might restructure this presentation, I kind of went back and looked at my work history. So I took the number of years, the number of jobs I've had since graduating and getting my undergraduate degree. And so I think my work experience falls about 39% in the private sector, uh, about 37 in the public sector, that is with government and nonprofit, and about 14 plus as an entrepreneur. Um, so if you add, most of my experience in the private sector was with management consulting companies, about three, and uh, so in that capacity, I worked with a lot of small businesses, both here uh, and in San Francisco Bay Area. So hopefully that will be enough to kind of fit me into the entrepreneurial series. Well, ho hopefully it does. Um, since this is an entrepreneurial course, I assume that most of you or at least considering going into business as an entrepreneur. And so I thought I'd at least give you some exposure to the organization I'm working with. This is a, a federal state organization that basically uh, helps promote international trade. Now, in doing some background uh, research, on the BYU, I understand a good deal, maybe a predominant number of the students here are international students. Um, I think, is that pretty accurate? So that being said, um, I hope if you, whether you decide to stay in the U.S. and, and uh, continue your studies and maybe eventually settle and start a business here, or if you choose to return to your home countries and start a business there, that you, know, you keep in mind some of the benefits of these foreign trade zones that exist throughout the United States. There's over 250 uh, throughout the continental United States and here in Hawaii. And there's a number of trade zones, and they may go under a different name, but they're very similar, called free trade, uh, free trade zones. You know, these are zones that are established in many countries throughout the world. They essentially provide the same kind of benefit. And for those of you particularly who are interested in export-import, uh, this is a program that um, is timely, and I'll mention, I'll get to that in a minute, and certainly beneficial in that it, it saves you money. It basically saves you money. I, I say it's timely because if you've seen the news today, the, the, the U.S. imposed tariffs, uh, about $50 billion on specifically Chinese goods. But as a result, I think the stock market dropped 700 points. Well, you know, we've seen a lot of volatility over the last 
few weeks, and, and that may all be recovered. But in any case, there's certainly going to be repercussions from that uh, imposition of tariffs. And part of the reason for the establishment of these foreign trade zones by the United States was be exactly because of that. Back in the 1930s, you know, the 1929 depression caused a great deal of hardship, loss of jobs. And, and part of the reaction to that was to impose the smooth harley tariffs, which exacerbated the, uh, the situation worldwide by imposing tariffs on a great number of goods. To counter that, in 1934, the U.S. established the uh, Foreign Trade Zone Program. At the same time, they established the Export-Import Bank. Uh, both meant to assist American manufacturers in competing worldwide. So the foreign trade zone basically uh, allows importer, American manufacturers specifically, to bring in imported goods, in many cases transform them into finished goods, and when they leave the trade zone, they may be assessed a lower tariff. At the same time, when they are in the foreign trade zone, they don't pay a tariff. So in other words, it helps your cash flow. Uh, typically, a company that brings in goods, say from China, say a $100,000 shipment, will pay $5,000 immediately when it arrives at the dock in Honolulu. That same shipment of goods, if brought into a foreign trade zone, will have that duty deferred until that inventory is drawn out of the warehouse and put into uh, sale in, in the U.S. So for many companies, it's a substantial savings. And throughout the United States, we've seen a number of companies establish these trade zones to, you know, to take advantage of that, of that fact. Particularly on the East Coast, some of the southern states, a number of uh, companies, auto companies, pharmaceutical companies have established themselves in these trade zones to take advantage of that. So I just, just wanted to kind of briefly highlight some of those things and just also just show you a bit about our foreign trade zone, which um, you probably, if you've gone downtown at any time, uh, you, you will probably have passed it. It's right across from Restaurant Row, right across the, uh, right at the intersection of Punch Bowl in Ala Moana. If you've gone by there recently, the roof is covered with photovoltaic panels. Uh, we just installed those to bring down our electrical costs. We probably have the largest, uh, in terms of square footage, uh, array of panels in the downtown business area right now. Um, but anyway, it's, it's pretty distinctive if you were to drive down there, you'll, you'll see it. And, you know, it, it is basically a, well, I kind of described that, so I won't go through this. At first, uh, it, it's been in operation since 1966. It was first located uh, over on Pier 38. Unfortunately, these pictures uh, aren't really positioned properly, but it moved to its current location in uh, 1982. In 2014, we, we converted a portion of the warehouse into office space. So we have about 74 office tenants who uh, they all have to be uh, transacting some kind of international business, selling a product or a service. But 
uh, we do provide pretty affordable and convenient rates for companies in, in the downtown area. We also have uh, other facilities across the state. We operate the program uh, for the state. It's, it's basically a federal program with the state as a guarantee. The state, uh, through its Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, and the Foreign Trade Zone Division operates this. We're under the jurisdiction of the uh, Customs and Border Pro Protection uh, Agency within Homeland Security. So in addition to the uh, Honolulu facility, which is the main one, uh, we're also, we also have a facility in Hilo, and then we have designated trade zone areas on the other neighbor, island, uh, neighbor islands with the exception of Kauai. Um, we were the first to have an oil refinery. We did kind of a lot of kind of unique manufacturing. Uh, these are the countries last year that we got goods from. Um, so a little quiz. Uh, so who, who knows the country that Hawaii sends the most goods to? There's a prize. So. It's in the Pacific. What? Uh, no. No. Starts with an A. <laughs> good, good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and who do we get the most goods in terms of value from? Japan. Another? No. No, no. Starts with an I. Indonesia. Very good. Okay, so what is, what is the commodity from Indonesia? Toys. Pineapple. <laughs> Put it in your car. Gas. Oil. Okay, so what's the largest uh, <laughs> export to Australia? <laughs> okay. Well, a lot of you uh, who aren't from here, from Hawaii, came here on it, so. A boat? Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe, but no, that's not the one. <laughs> okay, aircraft. Now, that's one thing if you start looking at international trade and international statistics, you have to be aware of. Obviously, Hawaii doesn't manufacture aircraft, but. Uh, the way the statistics are, are calculated is that it's the last American port. So typically, aircraft going to the Pacific will land in Hawaii, be refueled, and go on to its final destination. So because of that, you know, we have this very large number and value of aircraft, you know, and again, we don't, have very, we have very little manufacturing and certainly no aircraft manufacturing. What would be the largest uh, export that we do produce here in Hawaii? Anybody? 
Close. Okay, well, when you go to kind of a fancy restaurant, maybe you'd order it. Uh, Calamari. <laughs> okay, well, uh, shrimp. We're big producer of broodstock shrimp. A lot of the shrimp that other countries are growing out and sending to the U.S., the, uh, the species was developed here in Hawaii. Uh, you know, at one time it was the only pathogen-free uh, shrimp, and so there's you know, very high demand for this shrimp. Uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot, we just don't have the land area, and then the, we have high labor costs to actually make it a, a big export industry, but we do excel in, in doing the research and uh, being able to produce a product that is in demand around the country. Um, anybody know what the green flag is? Brazil. No, on the on the on the second to the bottom line. Right, and there's a couple of other Arab countries that that are the suppliers of petroleum uh, that we get here. And these all come the petroleum products. Believe it or not, they all come through the zone. About 54% of the total imports and exports that uh, uh, come through the trade zone because in addition to our warehouse facility, we also operate what are called subzones, and we'll come to that in a minute. These are areas that our two oil refineries are located. Uh, the, the gas facility is located and also uh, a business that uh, essentially their job is they refuel the planes that fly internationally. And so they're also located within the, within the foreign trade zone. Okay, so I, I'll just go through this kind of quickly. I mentioned some of the advantages. We have like a, it'd be like a three and a third acre warehouse. Uh, temperature controlled rooms. This is mostly sake, so. Uh, I mentioned we have office space there. Uh, big conference rooms, so a lot of the uh, organizations around town that are involved with uh, export, import, uh, use the facility. In fact, a lot of them are also have offices there. Four of the eight customs brokers, you know, who are an essential part of the whole trade process are located in the trade zone. Also, the U.S. Department of Commerce Commercial Service is located there. If any of you are, you know, seriously interested in looking at import, export, selling goods, particularly selling goods from the U.S. overseas, that's really an essential office to work with because they'll identify buyers for you overseas in different markets. So again, those of you who are our international students and want to uh, perhaps one day set up a business and do business with the U.S., you know, at some point while you're here, it might be worth uh, taking a trip down there and, and meeting the people in that office. They also, we also, in our conference room, host a, uh, a free series of workshops on export. We just did a big one on uh, e-commerce, particularly e-commerce uh, as it's used in Asia. And those are free. Now, probably terribly inconvenient for anybody here to go to it, but uh, those are online. If you wanted to actually just stay home and see it, you can go online and, and take a look at it. They're really very valuable. So again, a resource that uh, you can access and help you, you know, if you do decide to you know, go into business. 
And those are just some of the pictures of those subzones that I mentioned, the uh, facilities where the oil processing takes place. Uh, oil is brought in, say from Indonesia, processed and then sent out again. Uh, so, you know, it shows up in the import figures, shows up in the export figures. And then one of the companies that's not fuel related, they bring in these pellets, which are then converted into bot plastic bottles. So um, maybe that water bottle, uh, soda, juice, whatever. Many of those bottles or things that are uh, uh, packaged here in Hawaii, they're put into bottles produced by that company. You know, again, they get the trade benefit of bringing in these plastic products from Asia, deferring the duty, and then uh, paying the duty just as they bring in, bring out parts of that plastic they need to bring into their manufacturing process. So, again, something for the future, but, you know, I hope you, if you are interested, it'd be, Happy to talk to you more about it. And we have, I have some brochures, certainly not enough for everyone, but you know, there are brochures. Before I move on, I did want to mention, uh, we do have internships. We have paid internships. Ter again, it, one of these things that may be terribly inconvenient <laughs> for people here, but, uh, and, and I know some of you who may be uh, international students and perhaps the university too has limitations on work, I don't know, but we are looking for interns who can do work pr pretty much remotely. We worked uh, rec recently with, uh, UH, we got someone to help us with translation of our uh, marketing materials into Chinese, into uh, Mandarin. Uh, we worked with some students, again, you know, they worked at home um, and did some market research for us uh, using trade data and doing some analysis and reports for us. Again, if it's something that you're interested in, um, you can send in your interest to that email address, administrator uh, at ftz.org, and you know, we'd certainly be happy to consider you. Um, I also want to make sure, uh, perhaps you'll remember us, perhaps not, but if you need a flashlight, at the end of this, we have some. Got our name on it, it's pure advertising, but <laughs> if you want one, come up and get one afterwards. So anyway, that's the FTZ. So that's what I've been doing uh, for the past three years. I can, like I said, I've had this uh, kind of rolling experience of public sector, private sector, entrepreneur. Uh, yeah, and it, it kind of, I kind of noticed recently, it's kind of come full circle. When I started up, well, I started up my consulting company after working for about nine years for Grant Thornton. They're one of the national accounting and consulting companies based in Chicago, but offices all over the country. Um, they, uh, I got transferred from the San Francisco office to the Honolulu office. Most of the, uh, our focus, Grant Thornton's focus was always kind of the middle market, um, not the, you know, five, Fortune 500, the very large corporations, but kind of the mid-tier mid businesses and a lot of small and developing com companies. So. When I was in the Bay Area, I worked with a lot of the startups. Uh, this is back in the uh, 80s, late 80s. And a lot of those, you know, the computer industry was just kind of getting rolling. Um, a lot of the uh, companies associated with the whole technology was just kind of getting rolling. And it was really kind of an exciting time to work with 
companies at that time. So uh, I thought that was a great experience. And then I got transferred to the Honolulu office and uh, Honolulu office was a bit behind. I don't think anybody at a senior level had computers. The only people who had computers were the secretaries. So it was kind of a education process to uh, go through and uh, get an adoption of uh, the technology within the office, let alone the customer base, you know, which was the Hawaii companies. But that was uh, part of the challenge of working here. Um, it wasn't an entirely difficult move. Uh, oftentimes, and, and you may have experienced this, you know, if you've come from different parts of the country or different parts of the world, you know, there's always an uh, adaption phase. But I think, you know, the biggest thing is how quickly you get through it and how quickly do you recognize the advantages and what you can learn from your immediate environment. I think that's one of the best things about whether it's consulting or just travel in general or going, getting out of your comfort zone. I think that's one of the things in terms of my career I've always enjoyed. Consulting at first it can get a, be uh, sometimes scary because you get thrown into situations where you know very little about the industry. But, you know, you're expected to uh, provide a service, you know, be uh, credibly represent the organization and actually get something done. You have to learn to adapt, you have to learn, uh, you have to learn to learn on your own and you have to learn to re reply on others within your organization and outside to help you go through that growing process. And I think that part of that constant challenge is one of the exciting, interesting things about the whole management consulting uh, profession. Um, part of that thing about getting outside your comfort zone, you know, I, I think it was mentioned, my first job out of uh, school, out of after getting my BA, about two weeks later, then I was in Ghana, West Africa, and I think up to that point, I may have never been outside of California. Uh, maybe, yeah, probably not. And so it was the first time I went to the East Coast because we did our training in for a week in Philadelphia, and then we went on to Ghana. Uh, so for the first couple of months, <laughs> I think I, and along with everyone else, was kind of disoriented. But after a while, you know, you, you do learn to adjust. We did have probably a 10 or 15 percent attrition rate. You know, some never made that adjustment. But as it turned out at the end, we ended up with probably a, a 15 percent or more uh, holdover rate, people who extended their service in, in, uh, in the country. I ended up staying an extra two years beyond my normal service. You know, normally Peace Corps volunteers go for two years. And uh, I ended up staying for four. I, uh, I had set out with certain things that I wanted to accomplish. My job was kind of unique in that there were 10 of us and we were assigned to help establish their national track and field team. Uh, this was in 1969 and the uh, Kenyans had done extremely well in the Mexico City Olympics and Ghana had always been kind of the West West African rival to, to Kenya in athletics. And so there was this national impetus to try and regain that African glory. So uh, they brought in Peace Corps volunteers. You know, we work for free. 
you know, so <laughs> there's not a whole big outlay of cost on their part, but they just wanted to try and form uh, some basis of, uh, of a program to compete. And so we were assigned each to a region, which is like a state here, and asked to go out and form teams, build facilities, and uh, you know, train up people to go into these competitions. And so uh, while I had competed in high school and college, you know, I, I didn't know anything about certain sports, certain uh, aspects, shot put, for instance. And you, you have to learn. Uh, I had to go out and talk to the chiefs in certain areas to get permission f to get help to build tracks. There are a number of things that you had to do with no support and no way of knowing how to do these things and no guidance that you just have to get on to and do yourself. And for me, when I went, came back and got an MBA and then got jobs, that was really helpful. You know, having gone through that in a completely foreign environment and being able to cope was probably one of the best things that could have happened. I think it made the MBA experience much more valuable. It made subsequently working uh, in the various jobs much more valuable. And I don't, I mean, you know, all of you have ch probably for the most part, I would imagine most of you aren't from Hawaii, but you know, you've done that to a certain extent. You've gone away from your comfort zone. You're not going to school uh, six miles away from where you grow up. You know, that's part of the whole process, I think, uh, to take advantage of that, that learning experience. It, it will be a great help, you know, as you move into your careers. So I salute you for making the choice to come here and trying to learn something different. And particularly with the environment you have of so many international students that, again, if you do go into international business, you know, what, what greater uh, experience can you have than getting to know people from those countries? Uh, just, we've tried to continue that. You know, my job, I, we do see people who come from different countries, but, you know, they're primarily from Japan and the Asian countries, but, uh, you know, my wife and I have tried to continue that experience and satisfaction that we gain by, we've been host uh, parents, host family for students at the East-West Center, uh, the program that's held over at the University of Hawaii. So we've hosted students from China and Vietnam, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, M Mongolia, and Japan. And so not only do we get this opportunity to learn a whole lot about them, uh, you know, we also talk business with some of them because many of them are enrolled in business programs. And we've also had the opportunity and the reason to go visit these places. A couple of years ago, we went to Nepal and Bhutan, and we're planning to go to Mongolia a little later this year, and we're going to Japan next week. So, you know, these are all experiences that, you know, while they're personal, you get a lot of personal satisfaction out of them. They really can help in business. I mean, if, for example, I mean, this, it's kind of it's strange, but, uh, you know, we had somebody who inquired at the foreign trade zone about using the facilities. They're a company based in Japan, but, you know, they came to Hawaii and they saw some opportunity. So I, said, I sent him an email, I said, well, I'd be happy to meet with you, but um, I'm going on this trip to Japan, so I won't be around. So he said, oh, come and visit us. Come to my company, we'll show you around. I thought, you know, how many times do you get this chance to go see something, uh, a business, you know, in another country? And the same thing when we went to Nepal and Bhutan, you know, we had that same opportunity. So it, uh, if you have that chance, you know, take advantage of it, uh, I would say.
for me, you know, it's really made a difference both in, I think, professionally and just, this, you know, your personal life, your satisfaction of uh, making friends and learning a whole lot. And it, uh, it's not intentional, but it, some of that experience can be monetized, so uh, it's valuable. Um, So I don't know how much time we have, do we? Oh, okay. And the elf, oh, so questions? Sure. Okay, okay, so my mouth's getting a bit dry. So if anybody's got questions, you know, now's a good time. What are the, some, some of the criteria that, um, that business is allowed to be Well, you have to be registered with the state. I mean, you have to be a real business. You have to have a business license. And you have to be in international trade. Now, that could be trade in goods. It can be trade in services. But as long as you have some, uh, you know, you're doing business transactions in either of those two areas, you, it's fine. You're eligible. Is there like a price, like a, a certain value that's required? Like, you're too, like somebody could be too small to qualify to be there? No, I mean, it's basically, uh, you know, you do get charged rent if you have an office space, depending on the, uh, the, the particular space you take. You know, that new, that slide I showed you with the new building. Uh, that square footage is about, about two dollars and twenty cents a square foot. Okay, we don't charge any what's called common area maintenance, so we take care of all the grounds and facilities. That's quite a bit cheaper than if you were to go out into the uh, commercial market. You know, typically companies will charge you that common area maintenance, and so your base rate plus the common area maintenance will be considerably higher. On the other side, it's quite a bit lower because it's an older facility. It uh, is more like a dollar thirty per square foot. There's a charge for the warehouse if you you know if you store your goods in the warehouse, and that charge depends on the status of the goods when they come into the trade zone. If they come in as foreign foreign goods with no duty paid, they come in at a lower rate than if you had your goods, and, which is uh, more of a typical Hawaii practice, goods that go, say, from China to the uh, Los Angeles, Seattle, San Francisco, then put on a ship and brought back to Hawaii. Those will be charged a higher rate. And um, those things are all, the, the actual rates themselves are included in those for sure, but there are charges, but you know, they're, they're nominal. But what you really have to do is you have to make a business decision. Does the advantage of using the zone, particularly in the area of cost savings, um, justify using it? Because, you know, like many companies use uh, bonded warehouses or they clear their goods. Uh, in Los Angeles, bring their goods directly into a warehouse and distribute. You know, th you know this. You probably learned about it in your courses. You know, it's just in time inventory, and so you know you use the the ships to be your warehouses. You know, you bring it off the dock, you put it into the store, and you don't incur the warehouse costs. But there are there are industries that require that. You know, you have inventory available. You can't really wait for a week or two for the uh, time on the ocean. And you have to have that access. And so uh, facilities like ours play a big role in that. 
we, you know, in the zone, aside from the petroleum products, we have a lot of food products. Um, surprisingly, there's very high tariffs on things like rice. You know, obviously Hawaii eats a lot of rice, different varieties. And you'd think many f food products, you know, the tariff would be fairly low, but for rice, it's fairly high. You know, it's over 11%. So if you defer that cost, it can be a, a pretty good savings. Um, you know, we also bring in, a, there's a lot of plastic and rubber products. Some of these things, many toys, they come in duty free, but there are other things made out of plastic, kitchen utensils and such that also have a surprisingly high duty rate. And the thing that, you know, for many years, um, the trade zones were kind of begin to look at kind of an anachronism, you know, because there's so many foreign trade agreements signed. You know, so duties would be lowered in many cases, you know, and especially you look back from 1934 when the program was set up. So many trade agreements uh, brought tariffs down or eliminated them entirely. We're kind of in a new era now at least under this administration. You know, at one time there was this proposal to have a border adjustment tax. That would have brought a huge amount of business to the trade zones. Now, if these tariffs on Chinese goods, uh, well, they, are, they have been imposed. That could have a potential impact on a lot of companies that do bring in Chinese goods. I mean, at this point, I don't know specifically which kind of goods that tariff applies to, but we would see that that's something that could have impact here in Hawaii. And that's what one of the things, you know, we're looking for the intern to do is help us dig into some of that data that we have and begin to be a bit more proactive in just contacting companies and, you know, have you started to look at this? Have you started to think about what this kind of uh, uh, action at the federal level can do to your business? So that's what, you know, we kind of envision the, the role of this intern to help us crunch these numbers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, when the uh, tariff on washing machines and uh, what was the other thing? There's washing machines and some other thing that went into effect. You know, there are certain countries, particularly Korea, that were affected by that. And so we started to see shipments drop off in those categories. But then you start to see other countries who aren't affected by those tariffs, you know, maybe begin to look into that as an opportunity or, you know, companies here looking to form new relations with new suppliers. So um, it's kind of a dynamic period right now and it's very uncertain, but just because of these um, trade policies that are emerging. Any other? <laughs> Is that the... any, any other questions? So anybody from any of these countries? Oops. Argentina, <laughs> Brazil, Canada, China. That one I don't remember. Um, 
well, we just started the program last year. Like I said, we had uh, two. We had the one I mentioned who did help us with Chinese translation, and then another who did it with some research. It was like the spring and some, uh, I mean, fall and spring semesters. So we didn't get a whole lot of uh, applicants at the time. And partly is, well, maybe entirely because it was unpaid. So we've, we're, this year time, we're offering paid internships. These internships there, you said they were remote internships, but potentially work from home. But those internships, are they only translating, um, translating into languages like that? Well, the, there was two we're thinking specifically. One is the translation, the other is the research data analysis. From home? Yeah. Yeah. You know, even for students who are in the immediate area, you know, UH, Chaminade, HPU, it's, it's difficult for them to just, transportation-wise, to get down to the trade zone. So we recognize that. So if we can, you know, we would uh, accommodate. And so, oh yeah, yeah. If you want a flashlight, don't forget. <laughs> Okay. <laughs>